Hello everyone, this is your Trivia, and welcome back to another Let's Talk Lore special mini-series where we will take a look at taxation and conscription during the Han and Three Kingdoms period. Now we'll be doing this in a pretty fun way, where we will take the role of an average family during the Han Dynasty, and as you can see here, we are a 40-year-old male living with our parents, which was a common occurrence in the clan-based society during the Han Dynasty. Our father is 56 and our mother is 57. Our wife is 38 and together we have three kids, ages 20, 14, and 2. And like the vast majority of households in China during this period, we are simple farmers. Luckily, we happen to own our land and measures 60 mu in size. Now mu is the standard Chinese measurement for land equaling 666.66 square meters so our farm comes out to be around 10 acres for those who are more familiar with imperial measurements. And this was an average size farm, as most farming households had less than 100 mu of land. And with millet being the main crop, a farm of our size in an average year can expect to produce roughly 2 dan of millets per mu of land, meaning our expected harvest is 120 dan where dan is a Chinese weight measurement, equaling 30 kilograms. And for a family of seven like ourselves, if we eat conservatively, we will consume roughly 90 dan of that, or 75% of our harvest, as most farmers during this period farm simply to sustain themselves. But of course, some portion of our harvest has to go to the central government as taxes. As China has always been an agrarian society, the most common form of taxation up to this point in Chinese history is tian shui, or the field tax, which takes a percentage cut of your annual harvest. This tax was paid out in actual crops, and the rate varied depending on the time period. During the Qin Dynasty, this rate was 50%, which was obscenely high. The Han Dynasty, which replaced the Qin, recognized this as one of the contributing factors to Qin's quick demise, so at the onset of the Han, the field tax rate was changed to 1 15th instead. However, due to the early wars with the Xiongnu during Han Wudi's reign, the field tax was raised to 1 10th. Yet as the Han slowly regained the upper hand in the struggle against the Xiongnu, Han Yuandi was able to return the field tax rate back to 1 15th, and to help farmers recover from those lean years, he even introduced special policies exempting half of the field from taxes, which made the field tax effectively 1 30th. And by 155 BC, Emperor Jing would make 1 30th the official Han field tax rate, as it would remain unchanged for the next 300 years as the Western Han, the Xin Dynasty, the Eastern Han, and even into the Three Kingdoms period would remain at this rate. So for our household, this would mean that out of our 120 dan of expected harvest, we have to pay four of them to the central government. Now of course, the government will not actually measure our harvest exactly every year, as typically there are records of the total harvest in any given area, and the government will simply look at past data to provide an average figure, and use that for field tax purposes. So if our farm ends up with a bountiful harvest, our tax will not change. Conversely, if the weather is poor and our harvest comes out lower than expected, our taxes would also not change. Unless the harvest is so poor in our area due to natural disasters or rebellions that the central government would often just exempt that year's tax for our area. Now, having roughly a 3% tax rate on production is quite low, especially compared to modern income tax rates. But while the field tax made up the majority of the Han government income, it is but one component of the entire tax system, as in addition to the field tax, there is kou fu, or the head tax. Now, the head tax is a uniform tax on every individual ages 15 to 56, regardless of gender and it amounted to 120 qian. Now qian simply means money, and the money during the Han and Three Kingdom period are copper coins called wu zhu qian. Wu means five, and zhu is a weight measurement, 
that equals 0.65 grams. So Wu Zhu Qian is a standard copper coin that would weigh 3.25 grams and was the common coinage of this period. And looking at our family, our father is 56 and is one year away from being tax free. So he would still cost us 120. Our mother is 57 now and no longer has to pay. My wife and I need to pay 120 each, while our eldest son, who is 20 this year, also need to pay the adult rate of 120. Our daughter, who is 14, only needs to pay 20, as anyone between 3 and 14 pays the child rate of 20 per head. Lastly, our youngest is still free, as he's only 2. Now, the head tax did not see much change during the entirety of the Han, even through inflationary periods, with Han Wu Di being the only one to add three coins to the child rate as he desperately needed money for his war against the Xiongnu. But despite being relatively stable, policies around the head tax were put in place and changed throughout the Han dynasty in order to help guide social behavior. For example, during Han Yuan Di, the age limits were changed to encourage population growth, as the child rate was shifted from 3 to 14 to 7 to 19, making all kids under 7 free, while delaying the adult rate until 20. Head tax for servants, slaves, and merchants were also double. So for servants and slaves, the head tax was the responsibility of the master. So by doubling their head tax, the central government uses this as a financial burden to discourage wealthy gentry clans from accumulating too many slaves and servants. Now, slaves were a part of the Han society, and their costs would range from 15,000 tian to 40,000 tian, going from the Western Han into the Eastern Han as the price rose over time. Now, unlike servants and slaves, merchants had to pay double because under Confucian society, merchants were seen as the lowest class mainly because they do not actually produce, but rather profits from simply buying and selling goods at a markup. So when you think of merchants, these are not the small artisanal craftsman who makes a good and then sells them, but rather just the middleman retailers who buys their product from farmers and craftsmen and sells them at a higher markup in the market. And aside from doubling their head tax, the Han also had taxes on the use of the marketplace, which was another tax designed to discourage people from becoming merchants, as the biggest fear was not having enough farmers to farm to make enough food for feeding the whole country. In a very similar manner of how we worry about not having enough engineers and manufacturing workers, as more students pursue finance as a career, for example. Lastly, the most expensive head tax went to unmarried women, ages 15 to 30, as they needed to pay five times the normal rate, which means when our daughter turns 15 next year, her rate not only jumps from the kid rate of 20 to adult rate of 120, it will jump another five fold on top of that, as if she remains unmarried, we would have to pay 600 in head tax just for her, which more than doubles our current head tax expense for this entire year. And this policy is obviously implemented to encourage marriage and thus population growth. And for daughters of merchant families and female servants and slaves who were unmarried, this rate is tenfold as both policies would stack together. So for our family, aside from finding a good husband for our daughter, our biggest task is to find 500 tian to pay our head tax this year. And the most common way for farmers to make money is to sell their excess crops. So we need to consume 90 dan ourselves and pay 4 dan in taxes, and that leaves us with 26 dan left over to sell. Now the price of 1 dan of grain varied drastically during the Han and Three Kingdoms period. As during the founding of the Han, the state followed the tin market price of 30 tian per dan of millet, and this was a hard price set by the government. But free markets soon took over. During the initial Xiongnu War, the military burden, plus the lack of production as a large number of men went to serve on the front lines, pushed prices to 500 tian per dan of millet. But such prices didn't mean that farmers got rich, as without anyone left to farm, 
we're not going to have a full harvest of 120 done. And there were going to be a higher tax rate as during the Hanwudi period, it was one tenth for the fuel tax. Now, following the war, at the low point during the Western Han, prices did drop all the way to five tian per dun, which definitely ended up making it harder on farmers to pay head tax as the oversupply flooded the market in a time of peace. Then during Wang Mang's rebellion and the Xin dynasty, Poor monetary policy led to massive inflations, where each dun was going for 2,000 tian, which made head tax much easier to pay, but the purchasing power went way down for everything else, as everyday items all skyrocketed in price. And while price fluctuation will continue throughout the Eastern Han Dynasty, a nice average price we can use is 100 tian per dun. Of course, as we approach the Three Kingdoms period, with war raging across the country, the price of grain would skyrocket once again, but at that point, we would be lucky enough to have any land and safety at all. Now, in the worst case scenario, where we find ourselves with a slightly poor harvest, but not poor enough to get a full exemption, and thus have no surplus crop to sell for money to pay the head tax, then we'll be forced to sell our farmland to wealthy clans who have the liquidity. Now, farmland prices during the Han Dynasty vary depending on fertility. If the land is largely barren with no irrigation, it would fetch around 500 tian per mu of land. If the land is irrigated and has relative fertility, it can go for around 1,500. And lastly, if it was very fertile and also had potential for other commercial uses, then it could go for as high as 4,000 tian per mu. However, selling our land is something we want to avoid at all cost, as we would have no means to buy it back. And with less land the next year, our harvest and outlook will only continue to get worse until we are forced to sell all of our land, at which point our only choices is to either become day laborers, making 10 to 15 tian per hour, or performing manual labor for the government's public work projects for 2,000 tian a month, or become a tenant farmer for wealthy landlords, where half to 60% of our crop yield would go to them to use as the rent on using their land. And as a matter of fact, during the late Eastern Han period, tenant farming became a major issue as the central government found themselves powerless to improve the livelihood of their poorest farmers, as any reduction of taxes only ended up benefiting landlords more as they owned all the land, while tenant farmers saw very little of the benefit go to them. Compound this with wars and rebellions, and you end up with a massive amount of displaced, landless refugees, which is also the reason why Three Kingdoms will end up pursuing the Tun Tian policies, which is something we'll talk about at the end of this video. Now, assuming we have enough money to pay the head tax, there are still other taxes, such as the salt tax, as salt was a heavily regulated nationalized industry. Now, the nationalization of salt in iron industries also happened largely during the Xiongnu War, as these two necessities were seized by the government to ensure the army had enough salt and iron, while also charging the citizens an extra tax in order to help with the war effort. And the salt industry in particular had strict rules, where there were specific purchasing quotas. For example, for our family, each adult male can buy up to 4.5 sheng of salt per month, females can buy up to 2.5, and small kids can buy up to 1.5. Now most of the time, even if you didn't need it, you will try to buy up to the maximum, as you can sell it or trade it with other families. So we can technically buy 22.5 sheng per month, and 100 sheng equals one dun, which is 30 kilograms. So it comes out that we are legally allowed to buy roughly 81 kilograms of salt per year. Now this is a huge number, but you also have to remember that aside from cooking with salt, Salt was also the main method for preservation of food during the winter month. And whatever extra we have left over, we can always sell or barter. So looking at the price ratio for salt, it's always kept around the grain price of the time. And in the beginning, early periods of the Western Han Dynasty, this was a two to one ratio. 
and by the late Eastern Han Dynasty, this has ballooned to a 5 to 1 ratio. So 2.7 dun of salt per year will end up costing us 13.5 dun of millet, which is a significant cost, but since no one can live without salt, it is what it is. Then there are smaller taxes, such as zu shui, or rental tax, which are paid directly to the emperor instead of the national treasury, as Chinese dynasties had a dual tax system, where certain taxes, such as the field tax, the head tax, and the salt tax, will go to the national treasury, but other taxes, such as the rental tax, went directly to the emperor's private treasury. Now, while this dual system might seem a bit weird or corrupt at first, you have to understand that these two treasuries had vastly different functions. The national treasury paid official salaries, funded public projects, and paid wages to the central government armies, while the emperor was responsible for his own living expenses, the maintenance of his palaces, extra rewards to all officials and army, extra military expenses during wars, and disaster relief. So in order to fund all these activities for the emperor, the rental tax is a licensing tax for the use of public land. Now, public land here means pretty much all non-private owned farmlands. So forests, mountains, valleys, plains, rivers, oceans, marshes, and even marketplace or public squares and parks are quote unquote property of the emperor. So if you use them, then you have to pay a rental tax. For example, our family might need to go to a nearby forest to cut down lumber for firewood. Well, since the emperor owns the forest, we need to pay a licensing fee to chop wood. So there is a rental tax to use the forest. A merchant might want to set up a stall in the marketplace, so he needs to pay a rental tax to the emperor to use the land for his stall. A fisherman goes out to sea and fish, so he needs to pay a license to do that, which is his rental tax for the emperor to use the sea. And it's not really a foreign concept, as we still have many of these same licensing fees today. And these fees were not high, as the emperor relied on the volume and breadth to make enough to fund his treasury. And looking back at the finances of the Han Dynasty, the emperor often made double what the national treasury made. But oftentimes during war, the emperor was expected to empty out his treasury to help with the war effort, as it was the emperor's responsibility to protect his people. And even the greedy and stingy Liu Hong emptied out his entire treasury to help during the Yellow Turban Rebellion, which is why when he needed to fix the West Palace in 185, he ran out of money and had to introduce a new land tax to make up for it. Now, it also helps that emperor controls the mint, so the minting of new coins or the discovery of gold in mountains that the emperor owned are all ways the emperor can enrich himself. But oftentimes, those gold have to be rewarded out to officials, so it's not just him keeping it himself. Lastly, there are a lot of other small taxes that include things like the liquor tax if our family buys alcohol, or barren land tax in case we own farmland but don't plant in all the available land, then the government will expect us to pay in dried grass for the land that we kept barren as a form of tax to encourage farming and also to help feed the warhorse farms that the government have in the north. And these are all very minor in costs, so if we tally things up, our farm will yield 120 dun of millet, Four will go to a field tax, we can sell five to make up the 500 for the head tax, 13.5 goes toward the salt tax, and we also need to consume roughly 90 dun ourselves, which leaves us with 8.5 dun for other uses, such as saving up for a dowry for our daughter's wedding next year, as there is no way we can pay her increased head tax as our family barely scrapes by for yet another year. Now aside from taxes, the government also demanded your time as conscription was mandatory, and there are two main forms of conscription, called gongzu and zhengzu. Gongzu happen every year, during farming downtimes, where every male ages 23 to 56 were expected to serve one month in the local garrison. Here you're expected to have basic military training, provide basic security, and most of all, work on public projects such as road building, irrigation canal digging, or city wall repairs. And this happened every year, unless you have finished your zhengzu, which is when you become exempt from gongzu. Now zhengzu 
is two full year of service away from your home. They do not have to be done consecutively as each family is allowed to stagger their conscription to ensure that they always had able body male remaining behind to farm. But one of the two years, you are required to travel to your local commandery or princedom garrison, depending on if you lived inside a commandery or a princedom. Here you will be doing largely the same thing that you did for Gongzhu, but instead of one month of work for your local town, you're now working one year for your administrator or prince. And in both instances, aside from providing labor, you're going to get some basic military training. And in the case that your town or commander comes under attack, you are expected to fight. Now, neither of these conscriptions are that bad as you stay relatively close to home. You're not paid for either, but at least all your expenses are covered as the government will pay for your travel, your food, your shelter, your coats, your supplies during this entire period. However, the second year of Zhongzhu is what everyone dreads, as it is a one-year service in the central government forces, and there are only two places where the central government forces are located, and they are the capital city and the frontiers. Obviously, since conscription applied to everyone rich and poor, those with connections got the chance to serve in the capital city as part of the northern army that defended it, or be part of the city guards. Similarly, you're not paid, but all expenses are covered. But for most people, you got your one-year tour of the frontier, whether it's the border with the Senbe in the northeast, the vast border with the Sionu in the north, or the western mountains with the town tribes, or even worse, head down to the swampy jungles in the south. Regardless of your deployment, the chance of death went way up as disease in these hostile regions often took more lives than war itself. Fortunately, these posts are paid, as each soldier were given supplement food each month, which amounted to roughly two-thirds of a dun of grain during peace times and one dun of grain during war times. Now, of course, you could eat this, but oftentimes, grain prices on the frontier were five times, ten times, even twenty times the prices in the interior, so selling your grain for money is often what many troops did. Conversely, animals and meat prices were much lower in these areas, so buying livestock or meat is a very common occurrence. There are even records of troops buying a cow and trying to transport the cow back, as cattle was very expensive as labor on farms. But assuming you survived your one year on the frontier service and thus completed your two years of zhongzhu, then your conscription duties are complete, and unless there are special needs during difficult wars, you would not have to serve again. Of course, all of this went out of the window during the Three Kingdoms period, as war was the one constant. Now, before we move on to our Three Kingdom policy discussions, there are ways around Zhongzhu, as if you are a part of a rich clan or a powerful gentry clan, there are two ways you can be exempt. You can donate enough grain until you hit a donation limit, and then you become exempt from conscription. Or you can pay the government to find a replacement for you at a cost of 300 qian per month, or 3,600 qian for the year. Now obviously both of these prices are out of our range to pay as a humble farmer, but for rich clans this was definitely an option for kids who didn't want to serve. So. Let's close out our episode by looking at some of the Three Kingdom policies as the time of war changed a lot of things. Starting with Cao Cao, in Wei, we have the famed Tun Tian system, which really is a simple system of renting out abandoned farmland to displaced populace, and the government in this case provided you the land, the cattle, the seeds, and in return, 60% of your crop yield is given to the government, and during times of war, one in three able-bodied male in each household is expected to join the army for long stints, while the man who remained behind will also be called on to help with grain transports for the war effort. And at the end of the day, you didn't own the land or the cattle, but had the peace of mind that your family would not go hungry and would be safe during this turbulent time, even if you should die in war. Now, of course, not all households were under the Twin Tian system, as if you're lucky enough to retain your own land through this war, you still lived under the Hun tax and conscription system, 
and perhaps the rising grain prices can help enrich your family. But if war ever comes to your door, you might lose it all. Now, merchants in the Kingdom of Wei also thrived, not due to less taxes, but just the policies that encouraged trade with nomadic tribes, which were pacified by Cao Cao, and the Silk Road, which also returned to a relative period of peace under Cao Cao's rule. And even trade with the two other kingdoms were allowed and encouraged, as Cao Cao controlled the vast majority of the money supply and could afford to buy goods such as silk and horse from Shu and salt from Wu. And for the other two kingdoms, they also encouraged this as they needed the income to fund their war effort. And farther down south, the Tuntian farms of Sun Quan were quite different. Now, the south didn't have a large amount of displaced population, as they were largely undisturbed by the chaos of the later Han periods. So, oftentimes, they would have to import people as slaves from the far south. First, it was the Shanyue people. Then it was the Yue tribes that lived in the Jiao province that came under their control after Shi Xie became a vassal, and Wu basically used these slave-ran Tuntian farms to fund their armies, as the central government had a very weak control over the armies, since the Sun clan relied on local gentry clans and individual generals to fund their own forces. So it resembled more of a medieval system, where the lord would have to call on his generals to bring their forces together. During times of war, and this system came out of necessity, as the Sun clan lacked the legitimacy to collect taxes until they have declared themselves as one of the three kingdoms. So prior to that, they had to rely on the gentry clans in the south. However, once Sun Quan did become an emperor, he tried to implement a variety of economic policies to weaken the gentry clan's hold, including minting 1,000 face value coins, which did not contain any additional copper. In order to dilute the currency, to weaken the wealthy gentry clan and enrich himself, as he would use these higher denomination coins to buy up land. However, introducing a thousand face value coin in a hard currency system naturally led to massive inflations in the kingdom of Wu, and overall damaged their economy. As many of the Wu traders would prefer to buy overpriced goods from Wei. Rather than see their money depreciate at home. Now, lastly, we have the Shu Han government of Liu Bei, which used Tun Tian the least, as it did not happen until later northern expeditions, where Zhuge Liao mainly used it as a way to bond with the local population and provide local food sources for his troops during the expeditions. Thus, instead of relying on Tun Tian, Shu Han relied more on nationalizing industries such as the horse, silk, iron, and salt trades in the Yi province to fund their armies. Inflation was also a small problem, as Liu Bei did introduce a hundred face value coins early in his rule, as he too wanted to dilute the wealth of local gentry clans in the Yi province who were hoarding massive amount of the assets under Liu Zhang's reign. Now, while this led to inflation, it was much smaller in scale compared to Wu. And overall, under Zhuge Liang and Liu Ba's guidance, the Shu economy was quite good, despite the heavy expenses of the repeated northern expeditions. As the major issue for Shu had always been the lack of population rather than the lack of money. And with that, we're going to be wrapping up our taxation and conscription mini series. Hopefully, you all enjoyed it enough to hit the like button and drop a comment below on what you want to learn about next for future mini series. So thank you all for watching, and until next time, bye.